People are talking about the property crash in China. Is this actually a good time to invest? People are talking about a crash and I feel crash is not quite the right word because Biani Bauer, a true real estate expert and managing partner of NIA Sophia Group. It's interesting you mentioned WeWork as well. How has that co-working space in China particularly evolved? Because from WeWork, then you had Chinese competitors and then you had other competitors coming. It is a difficult business to begin with. Nobody has lost more money quicker than they ever did. And their stock is down by 99.7%. That is not a, a good return. Speaking of funny stories, have you got any juicy ones to share? from your time in China. Eventually he got panicking because the bank was after him saying you have to pay and so he said oh now I dropped my price again so we came again with the school then he raised the price again <laughs> then he started singing in the middle of the meeting right. he had a self-made song the whole situation was a little bit obscure and where would you say the opportunities are really right now? You have to look at where's that talent that's always more important than the real estate. Quickly before the episode starts, we've noticed that 83% of you are not yet subscribed. If you find this podcast interesting and would like to support us, please subscribe and we'll make sure to deliver the best guests and best content possible. Thank you very much. Enjoy the episode. Biane, people are talking about the property crash or at least a downturn in China. How do you see it and is this actually a good time to invest? People are talking about a crash and I feel crash is not quite the right word because we have a downturn in residential real estate prices of maybe about 20 to 25 percent depending on where you are there are of course certain cities certain locations where maybe even more than that but given the fact that over the past two decades prices went up by more than 10 times a lot of people that bought three five seven years ago are still left with a hefty healthy profit and only if you really bought at the very peak in about 2019, then you are now down on average something like 25%. And whether that's a good moment to invest, that's a very good question. And whoever knows the answer to that will be a very rich person. Mm. But what we usually do is no matter when we look at apartments or offices or factories or retail, we say, what's the return? If I'm buying this apartment or office and if I'm renting it out on the market, what am I getting in in a month or in a year? And as a percentage, what kind of a return is that? And if that return is, for example, for an apartment more than 5%, I would say, oh, that's a nice return because let's say in my home country in Germany, it's usually about 3 to 4%. But over here, it's usually just about 2.5%. So I feel, okay, that is not a good return. And therefore, I still feel even right now, the prices are actually high. In office, they are much more reasonable. You can get a return of more like 6 7%. And industrial, you can get returns of 8 9 10%. So my view is a return of 8 9 10% is very good. Then, of course, the question is for the average Joe, can you or I just go and buy a building, a factory, a business park? Do we have the money for that? Can we get the financing for that? But from a theory point of view, I feel it is that return because if you have a good return, no matter it's a real return or you live in that apartment yourself, but if that is a, an apartment and office that everybody wants, good location, good technical fit out, all of that, well, then also the value will probably go up mm. over time. And we're seeing this in Shanghai in particular, that, that there's just an influx of office buildings. Right now. You go to Shin Tian Di right now, there just seems to be skyscrapers sprouting up everywhere. Um, so do you see that as a big opportunity for particularly Western companies? Absolutely. As a tenant, as a tenant, these are good times, no matter China or the Western world. Actually, the situation is kind of better from a user's point of view or worse from a real estate investor's point of view in the Western world, especially in the US, because there, in addition to an economic downturn or at least not a boom time, you have all that work from home and you have an oversupply of offices. And here in Asia, including in Shanghai or Beijing or Shenzhen, you still have a relatively high utilization rate of offices. You have less work from home. So the office market in that sense is better than, let's say, in New York, where prices for office buildings have dropped dramatically, often somewhere in the range of 70, 80 percent. Uh, here, we also see property prices for offices dropping because more supply, as you mentioned, Therefore, the rental rates are under pressure a bit down. The investors expecting a slightly higher return, let's say the pension fund or investment group. So that combined leads to offices down, down in value about 40, 50 percent 
which is of course dramatic already. So you've been in China for nearly 20 years, which is a proper China veteran, right? You've been through it all. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your background. So how you came to China and how you built this great business and what your business actually offers. Of course. Yeah. So I came to China, to Beijing in 2003 at that time to study. Then I went home, got my degree. Then in 2004, I came and I thought I want to spend a year or two here in Shanghai. And that year or two, that basically became another year or two. And finally, uh, now it's 19 and a half years. Later this year will be the 20th anniversary. And I a little bit stumbled into that field. I had a little bit to do with it already back in Germany, but I came at the time and then uh, stumbled in real estate as a real estate agent and then found out that a lot of companies, they needed support in finding office space, factory space, warehouse space, retail space. And we set up a team to service that. So we are pretty much brokers, property agents, but with a focus on commercial real estate and which is quite unique in the market with a focus on helping the user. We often have agencies that primarily focus on helping the developer, helping the property owner push, market, sell, rent out their space. And we are saying we are helping the user to find the ideal space, get it at the best terms, get it at lower rates. So we are the tenants advocate. We are a tenant representation team. And that has worked out pretty fine. And we are still growing, albeit slowly, but we are, we are doing that successfully here in Shanghai. So what would you say your biggest USP is? Because we've seen quite a few foreigners leaving. Um, there's definitely still opportunities within commercial real estate. But what has made you stand out from the rest? And I think in a way we have been just very, very lucky to find good partners initially who were very honest and helpful, which is far from and of course matter, especially in this industry to find good team members, hardworking, loyal, honest. And then we always had that conviction of bringing transparency to the market. We found that the real estate world tends to be, no matter in China or in the Western world, an intransparent, inefficient one. And we believe by making it more transparent, we are creating value. We are helping companies find better deals, better rates. We find landlords to find tenants that maybe pay less but are a better fit, that will stay there long term, that will pay their monthly rental on time, all of that. So that is a bit where we come from, from that transparency angle and from that honesty angle and to say, okay, also our fees as agents, we make fees and people don't like to talk about it and people feel we earn too much and maybe they're right. But I feel, okay, let's at least put it on the table. This is how much we are making. This is who is paying us. We are only appointed by one side. We are making all of this very, very clear and known. And then we try to have the interests aligned to say, look, instead of you having to rely on me being a good and honest guy, let's structure the deal in a way that if it's better for you, it's going to be better for me. Mm. Then we both are very motivated to go that way. Mm. That's an interesting one because usually real estate agents, they're not so transparent with the agency fees. I mean, actually, my parents, they came from real estate. I don't remember back in the day 30 years ago, uh, them telling their clients, oh, by the way, this is how much commission we're making. And so that's a really, I think, critical part of your business, isn't it? That transparency, because then that's going to build the trust and honesty for bigger and, and better deals. Absolutely. And it takes some confidence and you also mm. got to defend it. People say, wow, you work on this and you show me around a few afternoons and you're making these tremendous amounts of money. And mm. it takes also a confidence to say, well, yes, and I think we deserve it because we are trying to give you a deal that is 20% better than the market and this is what we have done and these are our references and this is how we do it and we have a structure and we have a template and we run like a bidding and we let the different landlords compete and bid against each other and finally you'll get a much better deal out of it and what we are getting is a percentage of your saving and this is a great model. You've got to be convinced yourself in order to convince others and some disagree and that's also fine. We don't need each and every client. We want to try to convince them and if they think it's a good fit, we are very happy. And if they don't think so, that's also fine. But at least we have found out early. And the final point, of course, is the average time for us from a first client contact to a deal is 18 months. We usually work on average on a project like this, no matter it's an office or a factory or warehouse, 18 months. So there is a considerable amount of time invested that also we one way or the other need to get paid for. That's quite quick because in the UK you can be rolling into four or five years. So an 18 month period is quite an well, efficient well, model. Um, what I'm saying is it takes us 18 months of work on a deal till yeah. we get paid. 
Right. Whereas the clients, of course, they sign leases for five or ten years. Right, right. For us to make a repeat business often takes five, right. seven, ten years. Mm. But and also the eighteen months is like from the time we are engaged. Sometimes we meet them. Of course, we start selling them three years ago. Finally, they're ready to work with us. It takes eighteen months, and then also they have to pay for all the clients that finally didn't do business with us, which they may not like, but that's a reality of the market as well. And they know it in a way, so I can as well say it. That's just how it is. Yeah. And what is the quickest deal you've ever done? If 18 months is quite standard, have you ever done something in a month? Or we, like that? we did, we did. Yeah. Um, uh, when it comes to, let's say, smaller offices mm. that happen, somebody calls and says, hey, I forgot to renew or had an argument with my landlord. I thought I would renew, now I'm not renewing. And we have all these serviced offices, Regis, IWG being the most famous provider. WeWork became quite famous mm. in between. There are other ones. There are also nowadays providers where you don't have this business center serviced office thing, but you have offices where the landlord has already done a fit out, has a layout, uh, has, has done all that renovation work, which 10 years ago, that was not a thing. Mm. Everybody needed to hire his own construction company, build their own data system, air condition system, glass walls, all of that. Nowadays, you can get that. So we have done deals for the service uh, offices in one day mm. and for traditional conventional office space in about one month. And when it comes to industrial space, I'm not exactly sure, but I think the quickest may have been like four, five, six months, mm -hmm. which is already very quick for a factory to be relocated and set up and all yeah. of that. And it's interesting you mentioned WeWork as well, because I went through that system. So 2018, I went through WeWork when it was, you know, everything was great. It was a billion dollar unicorn. And then the next year, okay, there's no more beer. There's no more. So, um, so how, and you probably are more well-versed with what's happened. How has that co-working space in China particularly evolved? Because from WeWork, then you had Chinese competitors and then you had other competitors come in. So how has that business now well, evolved? You know, it is a difficult business to begin with because if you have an office building, often they, uh, sorry, I mean, if you have a hotel building, often the way they design it is that if they have a 50, 60, 70% occupancy, they already make good money. And if it's 80, 90, 100, wow, they make tremendous money. But in this serviced office industry, where often a player like IWG mm. would rent a floor of a building, they often need an occupancy of about 80% to start to be profitable. And then WeWork was a very special story because often there was no way for profitability. They paid more rent than they would ever make. Yeah. And they just believed they could raise capital forever. Yeah. So WeWork is a very funny story because I think not only within the world of real estate, I think within the world of private equity, of venture capital, nobody has lost more money quicker than they ever did. And their stock, I think, is down by 99.7%. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is not a, a good return. Mm -hmm. That's 0 0.3 cents on the dollar. <laughs> that was a very unique yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. But we do have, uh, of course, creative spaces. And we had them all the time. You know, even the Regis, they had uh, about 20, 30 centers many, many years ago. And they had one entire building. And in that entire building, they had one floor where they had that concept of, oh, you have a desk and it's all so mm -hmm. casual and so cool. They tried that. Mm -hmm. So even that wasn't really a new thing. Uh, so, so that is a, a unique one. Uh, of course, capital was plentiful mm -hmm. at the time. It's not anymore right now. I think that was a real missed opportunity because when I was in that system, you know, startup, meeting other companies and they had events, it was, it was a really great opportunity that I feel got missed there and I think in in Shanghai I think other people they've bought it and they? they bought the WeWork name and now they're repacking exactly it so so China is yeah. one of the few places where it's got separated because at the time yeah. when they were trying to sell China was the only thing that was sellable but according to the information available to me it got sold for six cents on the dollar, six cents on the dollar. So at a hefty discount and the new buyer thought at such a hefty discount, it would be a good deal. Mm -hmm. Then they realized that they are still bleeding cash. Mm -hmm. So if something costs you money, no matter how cheap you buy it, you know, it is a question if it's even worth that. Mm -hmm. So there are some other of these creative offices. Uh, I think the ones that work are the ones that do not rely on the rental income from these startups because the startups, they change, some grow, some shrink, some are stable, some are not. The way to make money is if you combine it with something else, for example, a creativity concept, mm -hmm. an innovation concept, you have a sponsor, you have a big Fortune 500 company, you have a big bank sponsoring it, you have the government sponsoring it, you have an incubator system. Mm -hmm. 
then, but if you rely on that rental income, the idea of let me pay a lot of rent and then collect a little bit of rent, mm. that is a bit of a losing proposition. There's clear disparity there. <laughs> the, I mean, there's many funny stories we, we can go exactly. into all the time. But uh, speaking of funny stories, I'm sure you've been through them all, right? So have you got any juicy ones to share from your, from your time in China? Well, let me try. I mean, right. a funny one was that we had up in the north of China, we had an Australian company, the Australian company, asked us to make an appraisal, do a pro broker's opinion of value report on their industrial assets, which that's something we are good at. We have various ways of uh, estimating the value of industrial properties, and we do that in a very international way, and that's often what these foreign companies like to see. So we did that, and they said, oh, that's amazing. Our properties, we, we thought in our books, they're worth a couple of million dollars, and you're saying they're worth $20 million. That's amazing. Can you please sell them for us? So we changed our roles for that deal, and we said, fine, we'll be the seller rep, and we are representing you in selling this, and we are blasting it out to the market, all the buyers, all the tenants, all the other agents come to us. And that went very well. We sold the properties, everybody was happy. And then the neighbor of that company was a Chinese boss. And he said, great, let me do the same thing. Find, find those guys. And he said, guys, I want you to sell my building. But his building was interesting because in the middle of the industrial park, he had built basically an office building or a hotel building, a glass tower. And that didn't fit very well with all the manufacturing like a, happening around. Like a pillar. Almost a pillar, middle, right? exactly. Yeah. It, it was like something like eight, nine, ten floors. It wasn't a skyscraper, but still usually you have single story or double story warehouses and factories. And he has like an eight story office building. <laughs> so we said, wow, that's going to be difficult. Mm. And then eventually we, mentioned, we managed to find a buyer for him, which was an international school because they needed a location a bit outside. They needed space for a cafeteria and they needed all of that. They could use the space for classrooms. That was wonderful. And then he found the idea so wonderful, the seller, that he said, you know what? I decided to triple my cost, uh, my, my price. And the school didn't like that. And then we didn't have a deal. And then eventually he got panicking because the bank was after him to saying like, you have to pay. And so he said, oh, now I drop my price again. So we came again with the school. Then he raised the price again. <laughs> then he started singing in the middle of the meeting. He had a self-made song. So uh, the whole situation was a little bit obscure. And finally uh, the school said, sorry, we can't deal with a landlord or seller like this. Uh, so we had to walk away from that. And uh, I don't know what happened in the end because I finally said, okay, tell us when you know a price that you're willing to sell, we'll sell it for you. But if you go up and down with your price, that won't work. Uh, so that was a funny one. Another one that we had unfortunately several times is that there's a foreign company and they have a Chinese joint venture partner mm -hmm. and the foreign company at the time agreed to bring in some machines, equipment, whatever. The Chinese joint venture partner agreed to bring in the land and the real estate. And that's how they formed the joint venture. Sooner or later in the process, the foreign company says, hey, we want to buy you out. They buy the Chinese joint venture partner. Everybody's happy. But the foreign company thinks they own the land and the real estate, but they never checked because you would need a granted land use right in order to own it for whatever, 40 or 50 years. But they had allocated land use rights, which means basically temporary land use rights. You get them cheap and the government can take them away from you at any time. So they think they own this. Then they come to me and say, hey, can you help us sell this? And we have to tell them, oh, you, we could, but um, it's the government who owns it. You are not owning it. Right. That's a bad surprise when, when, when they realize they don't own it. And we had one case where we uh, had a funny story about it then because we crafted a scenario and we said, look, this is now getting close to a residential area. We can't rezone it. If the government rezones it mm -hmm. and we own it, we have to pay the land premium. We have to pay that gap amount. That doesn't help us. Mm -hmm. Let's sell this off to a state-owned enterprise they can maybe deal with the government in a way that nobody else can. And let's tell them, look, you get it at a favorable price because we realize it's only an allocated land use, right? But pay us something for us to get out. Whatever we get, we are happy. And we got actually more than we thought even. And then we sold it off and they could probably redevelop it and make even more of it. So that was a creative solution to a pretty hefty problem. Well, whoever the lawyer was involved in that doesn't sound very good, but it seems like you came in and had a really good solution. <laughs> good, good that you mentioned, Nur. Yeah. I saw a report from the lawyers, and the lawyers mentioned somewhere that this property is worth so and so much, and we assume that you own it. 
And by that, they kind of disclosed that they guessed or knew or smelled that they didn't own it, right. but they just didn't say it clearly. Just so they were very smart right. about it. Right. They said, assuming that you own this. And I was like, yeah, look, the lawyers knew, mm. but they just didn't tell you. So you've obviously got that eye for opportunities when it comes to real estate. So where would you say the, the opportunities are really right now? If we're, if we're going to, you're entering China, you're a, a company, um, maybe Shanghai isn't the option. Are there some other place in China that you'd maybe recommend? Sure. And of course, it's first and foremost about the business. Let's say if you're a company that's producing something or selling something or doing both, you have to look at, for example, where's that talent? That's always more important than the real estate. Where's the talent? Where are my suppliers? Why are my customers? All of that. And I want to be positioned in relation to that. Then from a real estate investor's point of view, if you are having capital and you want to deploy it, in industrial real estate, business parks, logistics, warehousing, there are amazing returns. The prices still go somewhat up. So there are great opportunities there. Of course, then, of course, an international player have to has to access the, the political risk and things like that. But we do see that some of the international institutional money is coming a bit back into China. Mm. And then from a company point of view, if you set up a shop, a factory, manufacturing, whatever, assembly in these cities around Shanghai, you know, in Zhejiang province, let's say a Jiaxing, a Ningbo, mm. in the Jiangsu province, a Kunshan, a Taizang, a Suzhou, a Nantong, a Changzhou, all very hot places, then you can get amazing real estate deals. The government is often subsidizing it heavily. So we have had clients that take up a beautiful building the government is giving them rent subsidies for something like five years where they basically only pay facility management fee which is like 10% of the rent or even less than that and then they have free real estate plus they get certain tax holidays plus they get certain other incentives then they have a very good business case to say okay with very little capex I can get started here mm -hmm. then there are other programs for example for talent so that come on top and that is what a lot of companies exploit, and they should. Plus, you have in China, of course, all the suppliers. Like, we had a number of companies trying the China Plus One and setting up something in Vietnam and Cambodia and Malaysia and Thailand. But often they would find that their suppliers are actually still in China. So they're sitting there, they have to wait for their 10 or 20 or even 100 suppliers sh shipping them the raw materials from China. So it's in that case actually still better to be in China. And I think China is quite irreplaceable in that sense. The industrialization, the supply of raw materials, the supply of labor, the supply of talent. So I, from that point of view, I think China is now after COVID already on the uptick. Uh, I mean, Taitang, you go there, it's full of German companies, isn't it? There's some really big German companies out there. Absolutely, and, yeah. yeah. And... Taitang is the most amazing one. They have officially more than 500 German companies registered there. Yeah. And that's a big success story. And uh, many other cities try to replicate it. And mm. of course, it's not only about Germans. It's other Western companies that are very welcome. There's a technology transfer still taking place. They have local now vocational schools. The government is really supporting these enterprises because they realize these enterprises are also bringing jobs. They're also bringing tax revenue and so on. So yeah, that, that is really yeah. going on. So I guess to play somewhat the devil's advocate, what would be, and I, I guess it's a case-by-case -case basis, what would be the downside to maybe setting up in a Taitang or a, a Wuxi or something like that? Which I, I love these cities. I think there's loads of opportunities there. But what would you see as maybe a potential negative for going on? Well, I can't see a, an obvious negative, but we have for those cities because Jiangsu is really a wonderful province and the companies thrive there. But we had companies that say moved out of Shanghai far into the west of China or into the north of China, I'm not naming any cities now, and then realized that the local government did not do what they promised and they had constant issues with different departments. They were constantly asked to give certain payments and they couldn't do that, didn't want to do that. They didn't have the talent. They had it hard with logistics because there was no seaport. So there are these, and then they move back mm -hmm. and there's a lot of money lost on the way, a lot of trust lost on the way and so on. So it makes a lot of sense before one enters the market to study the market a little bit, take a little bit of time, create a little bit of a checklist or come to us for such a checklist and look a little bit, what do I want? Do I want to buy a plot of land, build my own building? Do I want to rent a building? How do I want to do it? What is it that I'm producing here? Do I get the permits? What people often don't realize when they come from Europe, that a lot of the Chinese regulations are much stricter than the European regulations. 
and they assume since we are compliant back home in France, back home in the UK, back home in Germany, we must for sure be compliant here. Mm -hmm. And then they realize, no, on certain levels, at least on certain measurements, certain materials, certain gases are rated as much more risky over here. And then knowing that ahead of time, of course, helps a lot. Yeah. So they don't really do that proper research and due diligence into... Like well, and you don't there. know what you don't know. You can only yeah. assume. And sometimes it all almost goes randomly. They have a lawyer helping them with the legal things or an accountant on the accountant things. In our case, we help with the real estate side of things. And then somehow you try to cover it all mm. and find solutions. And I guess it comes down to you've been very successful, in, obviously, and I've learned a lot from today. But what would you say if you were to distill those key factors that's led to your success? Yeah, and to get into detail, really, for anyone that's watching this. I believe that you got to be true to yourself. you got to be honest to yourself and honest to the clients. And I feel that here in Asia, especially for the people that you do business with on an ongoing basis, suppliers, clients, governments, and so on, it is even more important to be honest, transparent, and loyal. I do feel that in the Western world, those things are important. But it's also sometimes you're representing a company or a government body. I'm representing an organization, a company. We sign a deal in that role. And here it's very much about, okay, do you trust me? Do I trust you? Can we do business together? Are we somehow connected? Are we part of that ecosystem? And I feel as a foreigner, it helps a lot to approach that with a lot of humility, to be careful, of course, not to be ripped off. There yeah. are, of course, a lot of crooks as well, but to find good partners and then to reciprocate, not trying to take advantage of people. Also with our own colleagues, my philosophy is, let me try to pay you as much as possible what is justifiable based mm -hmm. on your skill set, based on your contribution to the business, based on our company. And often that is not such, so the difference is not big towards what's the minimum that I have to pay you so you don't quit, but it's a different mindset. Same with my clients, same with my partners. I'm thinking, okay, with that budget that you're giving me, what's the absolute best that I can do for you? What if you were my younger brother or my mom or my dad. What would I do for you? Trying to have that mindset. And I think that leads to certain little details. And that eventually leads to trust and leads to repeat business, leads to recommendations and leads to a situation where you eventually have a magnetic effect that people say, look, keep him in the loop. I want to do it with you. I even had clients who said, look, I found this building by myself. I don't need you to find it for me, but I want you to negotiate for me and I'm willing to pay you an agency fee as long as I have you as part of that deal. And that only comes from them thinking, believing, knowing that I'll work in their best interest and believing that they will have an advantage mm. out of it. So for you personally, what has been that, to get specific, that building that humility and building those relationships in China, everybody talks about really cracking that code. What has been that one thing for you that maybe you wish you'd known 20 years ago, but you utilize today in your business that helps you secure those clients? Certain things do take time. You can't rush your relationship. And if you try to do that, if you try to outsmart the system, if you try to bypass, you are actually hurting yourself. So the honesty also to tell a potential client, you know, I don't think I can help you. I don't think I'm the best fit for you. I think somebody else can help you better. Initially, in the early day, okay, you think I need to grab every opportunity. I need to make it work. I need to push it through. I need to cut a corner and finally it falls on your feet, you know. And eventually you learn, no, do the right thing, do the right things. And then those will work out and they will. you will survive. There will be a next deal coming. Mm -hmm. And something that doesn't smell good, okay, it's just stay away from it right mm -hmm. from the beginning. I think it's great that that honesty approach in China is so key, which doesn't really get promoted enough. Like being transparent, being honest is actually the way forward now really to do business. But thank you so much. I've learned so much about real estate. I feel like I want to invest now. I'm right, right in that, the thick of it. So uh, where can people get in touch with you? Well, LinkedIn is an easy one. You'll find me Bjarne Bauer. There are not many people going by that name. I do have a vlog, which we use nowadays for our promotion to inform people, some infotainment, so to say. It's called Crazy Buildings. And you just put Crazy Buildings or Crazy Buildings CRE, which stands for Commercial Real Estate, or Crazy Buildings China on YouTube, and you should hopefully find us. I've seen a few of your videos. They're, re they're really good. They're oh, really thank exciting. you. Thank you so really, much. Uh, I actually watched them to the end. I'm not just, you wow. know, so uh, I've thank learned a lot of them. Yeah, really insane. And edutainment, I think, is the, the way forward. Exactly. Really, you know, 
giving the audience something that they can laugh at, but they're going to learn something and come away. And That's away exactly the idea. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really Likewise. Enjoyed it. And um, yeah, see you in the next one, guys. Take care. Bye bye.